Conwell Charlotte. My name is Don Fairbairn. I'm the Dean of the Charlotte campus here at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And we are delighted that you have come out on this cold January evening to hear what promises to be the first of a very, very interesting and spiritually edifying sets of lectures. I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Daniel Block, who is recently retired from Wheaton College as professor of Old Testament. Dr. Block is one of the preeminent Old Testament scholars in North America and even throughout the world. He's a native of the Canadian Plains from Saskatchewan and holds a PhD from the University of Liverpool and has taught for at least a decade at four different institutions in his illustrious teaching career. I think that perhaps the only black mark on that illustrious career is the fact that he went to seminary at Trinity rather than Gordon Conwell. <laughs> but in his defense, I will say that at the time he enrolled in seminary, Gordon Conwell was one year old. So maybe we can forgive him for that this time. And we are glad that he has finally made it to Charlotte for the first time in his life and made it here to be with us at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Some of you may remember that one of our best Hebrew and Old Testament students, perhaps our best Hebrew and Old Testament student, was Carmen Ives. And Dr. Block had the joy of being her mentor, her doctoral supervisor, when she did her PhD at Wheaton after she finished here at Gordon Conwell Shaw. Dan, we are delighted to have you. We look forward to hearing from you. Let me open in prayer, and then I'll hand it over to you. Father, we thank you for bringing us together this evening. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to attend to your word and to learn from your word regarding the most central aspect of our existence, the worship of you as your people. We thank you for bringing Dr. Block to share with us what you have taught him from your word. We pray for him as he leads us in reflection, in thinking. We pray that you would grant all of us a deep sensitivity to your word and to the leading of your spirit as we seek to worship you as your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dan, thank you. What I was supposed to do since I was holding this book is to let you know that this is the latest of Dr. Block's many books, For the Glory of God, Recovering of Biblical Theology of Worship. This book is required reading in Biblical Theology Seminar, so if you haven't bought it yet, go ahead and get a jump on it. You will have to buy it and read it in that course. And I think if you ask very nicely, Dr. Block may even be willing to sign it for you after you pay for it. So thank you very much again. It's an extreme delight to be with you on your campus. I have heard a lot of you by the hearing of my ear, or learned a lot of you by the hearing of my ear. Now my eye sees you. You know, that's a quotation from Job, don't you? 40 to 5. And it's a delight to be here. Uh, it was a delight to have a representative from this place on our campus for four or five years, Carmen Imes. What an absolute delight she was as a student. And uh, I've always wanted to come to Charlotte to see the place that gave her birth. And here we are. I must say special thanks to Donald Fairbairn, Mark, Paul, and Roland Grams for your grace and patience with me in negotiating this visit. There were some hiccups along the way. It's all my fault, but uh, they were gracious and everybody was so kind. It was also a delight to be uh, a colleague of Catherine uh, McDowell for a couple of years when she was at Wheaton before she came here. So that's a, a, a good thing. It's a special honor to be here to meet Dr. Cooley. Thank you for all that you have done, not only in this place, 
but for the kingdom of God through Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and its many facets. It's a delight to meet you. And I pray that the Lord will bless us together tonight. In the past, churches have fought and divided over doctrinal issues like Calvinism versus Arminianism, modes of baptism, speaking in tongues, head coverings, and yes, sleeves on women's dresses. My roots are Mennonite. I know all about that. These days, when people ask you what kind of church you attend, chances are, though, they're not asking whether you attend a Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or Presbyterian church. They want to know whether your church is a seeker-sensitive church or is it traditional and all the baggage that goes with both of those labels. In part, the excuses for churches splitting over forms of communal worship lie in the New Testament itself, specifically the New Testament's failure. I'm not sure we should use that kind of language. Does the, New, does the scripture ever fail? But let's say the New Testament's lack of direct guidance for corporate Christian worship. Nowhere does the New Testament tell us to build churches, to meet on Sundays, to have morning worship services, to open with a song and prayer, to have a choir or guitars for that matter, or to have a long sermon or to close with a benediction. About the only practice it prescribes as a regular occurrence is participation in the Lord's Supper. Remarkably, especially in congregations in the free church tradition, this prescribed rite has been marginalized as optional and occasional while we fight and squabble over all kinds of other elements. Well, in my view, the crisis over worship arises from a woeful absence of a biblical theology of worship. Tomorrow I shall argue that true worship is demonstrated primarily in life. And that unless this worship is right, nothing we do when we gather in corporate worship will be credited to us as righteousness by the Lord. But tonight, the issue I would like to address is, what is the biblical paradigm of corporate worship or for the corporate worship of God's people. This is a problem. Under the influence of leaders who began their ministry as youth pastors in recent decades, the Sunday morning gatherings of God's people have increasingly become occasions for evangelism and taken on the flavor of outreach programs that parachurch organizations like Youth for Christ used to sponsor on Friday or Saturday evenings. Some of us remember that. This kind of worship involves two primary parties. Performers in the front who talk and sing either about Jesus, for the most part in third person, or of their own devotion to him. And on the other hand, we have spectators who passively observe their, uh, what it comes from the front. Some have challenged that paradigm established by people who make a living by doing music and peddlers of the worship industry products by appealing to greater participation by those whom the worshipists, uh, that's my word, treat as their audience. The Robert Weber School of Early Christian Worship and trying to recover a lot of that, they're reacting uh, to it. Some have proposed a new paradigm, identifying lay people who gather as the worshipers or performers, the worship leaders as uh, the lay people are the worshipers, uh, the, the worship leaders are prompters, and God is the audience. They find support for this view in no less a figure than Soren Kierkegaard, who wrote... 
uh, at the, in the 19th century. In the most earnest sense, God is the critical theater goer who looks on us to see how the lines are spoken and how they are listened to. Hence, here the customary audience is wanting. The speaker is then the prompter, and the listener stands openly before God. The listener, if I may say so, is the actor who in all truth acts before God. Well, under the influence of this metaphor, worship leaders and musicians especially fondly speak of playing before an audience of one. This notion of worship as theater, and God as the singular audience troubles me on several counts. First, the way people in the worship industry have applied Os Guinness's phrase, audience of one, to corporate worship renders the word audience meaningless. It suggests that God is the specter, spectator whose approval we must seek in our performances, well, I agree that true worship involves an audience that hears, but that audience has nothing to do with Kierkegaard's model. When we talk about audience, we're talking about hearing, and the spectator is about seeing. There's a, these are two generically different events. There's a problem then in the way we use the word worship. It involves a generic mistake. Who's doing what before whom? But second and more seriously, uh, it involves a, 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 a gross disregard of the biblical image which concern, corresponds more to the paradigm of an audience with a superior than spectators to people's action or even their speech. Today, we still speak of meeting with a person of extraordinary status as an audience with that person, as in, I've had an audience with a pope. Or, as a Canadian, I sometimes imagine what it would be like if Queen Elizabeth II would invite me to an audience with her. An individual or group may request an audience with a superior, or the superior may, on his or her own initiative, invite someone of socially inferior status to an audience, but it always involves the superior granting the audience. Even when the host tries to put the guest at ease, the latter must behave according to strict rules of protocol established by long tradition or modified by, a, by the host currently in office. In 2016, prior to the premiering of the net Netflix series The Crown, Vogue magazine's website published a list of seven rules on how to interact with Queen Elizabeth II should one be invited to an audience with her. And I sometimes imagine what that might be like. Well, first, when greeting the Queen, men should give a neck bow, tilting the heads only, while women traditionally curtsy. When addressing the queen, you begin with your majesty, and in conversation, you should refer to her as ma'am. Yes, ma'am. During a formal dinner, never take, uh, no, during a formal dinner, take the queen's lead. Stand when she stands, except, of course, when she's speaking. Wait until she sits to take your seat, and so on. Four, never turn your back to the queen. Five, when meeting the queen, there is a no-touch rule, meaning that you should never make first physical contact by touching her arm or shaking her hand. Only shake her hand if she offers, and even then, it's without a tight grip and little motion. Six, initiating conversation is generally discouraged, especially stay away from personal questions in regard to her grandchildren. <laughs> Seven, always present a gift to the queen. That's how you prepare for an audience with her majesty. 
An audience with a superior transpires at the superior's invitation on the superior's terms and with objectives determined by the superior. This image differs drastically from that assumed in the lyrics of many contemporary songs like this one. We have come by united pursuit. I want to follow you with all my heart. I worship you, God. We have come to give you glory. We have come to give you praise. You're welcome in this place. You're welcome in this place. You're welcome in this place. Have your way. Have your way. I could quote three or four or five or six other songs of this type, but they are problematic for many reasons. One, the literary register is contradictory and oxymoronic. On the one hand, it's far too low. I want to follow you in the presence of the divine king? Really? And on the other hand, it's archaic. Look at the uppercase second person pronouns. We never do that. You know, so there's a contradiction. And the formatting without punctuation looks more like a Twitter entry than a communique involving the divine king. Second, the self-laudatory tone in, in, in the grammar would be offensive to any superior. I want to follow you. I worship you, God. And third, the concept itself is fundamentally flawed. We have invaded his sacred space, and then we have the chutzpah to invite him in and authorize him to have his way. Who do we think we are? And who is inviting whom to an audience with whom? Whenever we treat God as the audience, we have occupied the throne and we treat him as our inferiors. Well, on the surface, in response, we appear to sing to God, but we are the theme of so many of our songs. Our songs should never be about our love for him. That's idolatry. They should be about his love for us. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Lovely tune. But so twisted. The only person you're praising is yourself. In my uh, Bible, that's idolatry. And of course, our gestures in worship are not expressions of humility and submission, but of entitlement and arrogance. Well, what then? If this is the problem... What is the solution? Well, I propose a shocking solution, a return to the Bible. Mine is a back to the Bible movement. And so that's where I would like to go. We need to return to the scriptures for our paradigm rather than contemporary culture or some venerable philosopher like Kierkegaard. If true worship involves reverential human acts of submission and homage before God, the divine sovereign, in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accordance with his will, rather than boasting to God about our forms of and enthusiasm for worship, we should be asking him what he thinks about worship and what paradigm he offers for acceptable worship. And about this, the scriptures are very clear. So let me talk about a couple of te texts. Let's go to Exodus 19 to 20. You know this passage. By the time we get to Exodus 19, the Lord has revealed himself to Israel in magnificent ways. What transpired at Sinai was the climax of a series of events the Lord had been anticipating since 312, where he said to Moses, I will indeed be with you. This is the sign that I am the one who sent you, Moses. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will declare your vassaldom. You will serve me at this mountain. We've got an appointment here. 
We've known that. Moses has known that since chapter 3, verse 12. Well, now, finally, they've arrived at this mountain. There Israel camped before the mountain, and Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, This is what you shall say to the house of Jacob, and declare to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed... Listen to my voice. Your translations always have this as obey my voice. Creating the impression that all that ever comes out of God's mouth is commands. And we forget that the first thing out of his mouth is always gospel. Gospel always precedes commands. Now then, if you listen to my voice, not just the commands, but hear the gospel as well. Uh, You will be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall serve me as a kingdom of priests. The Lord had brought the Israelites to himself. This is what happened. He didn't bring them to a code of conduct. He brought them to himself. In fact, four decades later, as Moses reflects on this moment, he refers to it as the day of the assembly. Before the face of God. When at the Lord's invitation, Moses had led the whole congregation into the presence of the Lord. With respect to the multi-sensory nature and intensity of the revelation of the Lord. And its function as part of the inauguration and commissioning of Israel as his covenant people. This was indeed a one-time event. And they responded to it with terror. Stop, stop. Or we're done. Moses, you go talk to him. We can't tolerate this. You know, so there are some aspects of that are absolutely unique, never repeated to be repeated. But on the other hand, this is an audience with a king. And it has every appearance of an audience. With the king, and if you look at the text, and I've got simply some of the t- some of the verses here in the narrative of chapter nineteen, so the people may hear when I speak. Who's talking? God answered him with a voice. He spoke all these words. People experienced the sounds. Your translation probably has they heard the thunder, or s- the people say, "Speak to us yourself. We'll listen, but don't let have God speak to us." This kind of audience is intolerable. And when when you go to Deuteronomy 4.10, where he reflects on it, it's more of the same. When the Israelites at Sinai, uh, what the Israelites experienced at Sinai had all the marks of a corporate audience with the heavenly king. First, the king charged his envoy to invite the people to an assembly before him. Second, For three days, the people prepared for the event by consecrating themselves, ritual washing, fasting. Third, the sound of a heavenly Herod's trumpet announced the emergence of the king from his heavenly throne room. Have you wondered about the significance of that trumpet? The king is coming, the king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see, or is it his voice I hear? That's what's happening here. The king is coming. At the sound of the trumpet, number four, Moses signaled the people to come up and meet God, and they stood at attention awaiting the king's rev- arrival. Five, the king appeared in all his glory, accompanied by fire and smoke and earthquake, makes Steven Spielberg's stuff look like kindergarten. Six, the king warned the people not to violate the boundaries of protocol. Seven, the king addressed the assembly. He talked. Eight, the people responded to their audience with the king with fear and trembling. Nine, through his envoy, the king reassured the people with a statement of the significance of the audience with him. And then ten, the people heeded the words of the king's envoy and stood at a distance while the king, while the envoy returned to the king's presence as a representative 
of the, uh, as a representative audience or subject. So this is an audience with the king. The Lord has invited, brought them to himself. They didn't ask for it. It was by sheer grace. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. That's what he had done. Now, I used to think, Deuteronomy talks a lot about the Lord choosing a place for the people to gather to worship him. As recently as three years ago, maybe four now, I thought, well, this was to institutionalize Sinai. So that what that generation heard at Sinai could become everybody's experience repeatedly. Well, there's only one problem with it. And I did a very careful study of Sinai and the place in Deuteronomy. They're shockingly different places. Sinai was a one-off deal. This we're talking about now is a regular standardized worship. Deuteronomy 12, 5 to 7. Uh, actually, it goes 5 to 14. Is the first time we hear of the place that I will choose for, to put my name, stamp my name, claim as my authorized uh, residence. 21 times you have that phrase in Deuteronomy. It's a very important deal. But the interesting thing is it starts in chapter 12, verses uh, 5 to 14. When we interpret this modally rather than imperatively, as your translations all do, mine do at least unless you're using some. But you, you, you must make pilgrimages to the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there to establish it. To that place you must come. There you must bring your offerings and your tithes. That Hebrew can be translated completely differently. You shall destroy all the pagan altars, but no, come. You may come to the place that I establish. My, it's an invitation to worship in the presence of God. There you may come. There you may bring your gifts. There you and your family may eat. There are four magnificent positive features of this. Note, notice first, Moses invites Israel to come. Most of your translations have, there you shall go. The Hebrew is very clear. It's a word for come. It's not the word for go. And also with respect to the offerings, there you shall bring your offerings, not take. You see what's happening? Come. Bring. Who's talking? God is saying, I can hardly wait to have you in my presence. Come. Come, bring your... So this is, this is good news. He invites the people. Second, he invites the Israelites to eat there in the presence of the Lord. As elsewhere in scripture, as you know, and in the ancient Near East, to eat together is a ritual of communion. We just did that. Why do we eat together? I mean, it's really rude to host people to a dinner because you spend the whole time, you know... Mm -hmm. And inevitably, somebody's going to spill and makes no sense to have formal conversation over a meal. It's totally inefficient. Except that through eating together, we celebrate our relationship. And that's what happens here. Third, Moses invites the Israelites to celebrate the blessing of the Lord on their work. Now, when you read the Exodus version of the uh, Sinai regulations, the word for rejoice appears only once in 23, Leviticus 23, 40. But in Deuteronomy, it's all over the place. There you may come, and there you may eat, and there you may rejoice. Well, we don't use that in everyday speech. When's the last time you heard somebody out there use rejoice? Stop it. That's old English. 
When you translate the text that way, you've created distance between the biblical text and your hearer. We would say, celebrate. Like after the Vikings win and last Sunday's football game. Celebrate. You rejoice. That's, no, celebrate. That's how we would translate. Fourth, in contrast to Exodus 24, 9 to 12, where only Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and the elders ate in the presence of the Lord. Here it's, y'all come. He lists heads of households, sons and daughters, male and female servants, landless Levites, aliens, widows, fatherless within your towns. Y'all come. The biblical paradigm of worship is never segregated. And so that when Paul writes in Christ, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, whatever. He is not fixing an Old Testament problem. He's fixing a problem that arose in the intertestamental period. That's not where Moses is. It's y'all come here. Well, although Moses repeatedly highlighted these worship events as happening in the presence of the Lord, at this point, there's not much emphasis on an audience with the Lord yet at that text. But when you come to one of the last references to the place that I choose for my name, chapter 31, verses 11 to 13, there it is, the audience. The Lord speaks. How does he speak? We're going to come back to that. I'm teasing you. Uh, We'll come back to that one later. So worship is an audience with God in the presence of God at his invitation. It is not uh, we who decide when, uh, well, what we do is we, we, we barge into the house of God and then we say, oh, Lord, come. We welcome you here. Really. There's something so fundamentally wrong with that. Well, let's go to one of the texts. Psalm 95. Here's an invitation to an audience with God. Although the way many exploit Psalm 95 in worship contexts, the way they do it is flawed for many reasons. Uh, uh, But it does really offer a very impressive picture of worship this is part of a cluster of what we call divine kingship psalms in 93 and 96 to 100 the psalmists call on all the universe to join in proclaiming the lord is king yahweh malak the lord reigns the lord rules but now in psalm 95 this is not for the world This one is localized. If anybody is going to proclaim the kingship of God, it's his people. This one is very focused. The psalm divides into three parts. There's the call to true and authentic worship, verses 1 to 5. Then there's the nature of true and authentic worship in verses 6 to 7. And then the evidence of true and authentic worship in verses 7 to 12. Just a few comments on each of these. Here it's in bigger print so we can actually read it. Oh, come let us shout for joy to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock. I imagine what this is about is the worshipers have been invited to come. And on their way up the hill to Mount Zion, they're excited. I can't believe he invited me. And we're singing the The praises of this great king who invited us. But you need to know that this is not worship. Strictly speaking. This is anticipation of an audience with a king. That's scene one. Let's go to scene two. This is the short. Oh, come. Let us. Your translation probably has worship. Here's that Hebrew word, hishtachawa, my favorite word. Oh, come, let us prostrate ourselves before the king. And if you don't like that interpretation, read the next word. Let us 
bow down. And if you don't like that one, read the next one. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Now we're at worship. You notice how the mood changes. In anticipation, at the invitation. We, but once we're in the presence of God, guess what? We're on our knees. Bowing, prostration, submission, and homage. Nobody is talking. Not worshipers, for sure not. And the Hebrew word, and of course, as you know, the Greek word proskanao has exactly the same semantic range as hishtachawa. Worship does not mean go to church. It means get down on your face in submission and respect and honor. That's what happens. Here's where the worship actually happens. And of course, you see, he gives the ground. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his head. He's just been singing the great transcendent qualities of God. Oh, oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Shout to the God of our salvation and to the creator of all. El Gadol, great God, king above all gods. But what really excites him is this one. We bow down. Because he has saved us. Really. And of course this is the way. The opposite of what we do. We barge into the presence of the Lord. And say here we are. Here we are Lord. Aren't you lucky. I could be out golfing. But I showed up in church. Not here. When you're in the presence of the king. You shut up. And you're down on your face. I don't deserve to be here. How did I get here? Who invited me? And, and of course, we don't do this much. This is what the Hebrew word worship means and the Greek word worship. It's translated, but we never do it in church anymore. When I was growing up, we did. When my mother taught us to pray, we always knelt. Midweek prayer meeting when I was a kid, when we prayed, we always knelt. But we don't have to anymore. We've come of age. We have no symbols of submission and homage anymore. And that's a tragedy. Other people do. Here's King Jehu prostrating before uh, the, the king of Assyria or his envoy. Here are some Egyptian figures here is, and some of you have seen this in the airports. Everybody else knows exactly what that is. But we don't have to do that anymore. And of course, you know this one. This is worship. But it's something, the, at least in the free church tradition. Our kids in Vancouver, our members at St. John's, Anglican Church, where David Short is a pastor. Going to visit them is a highlight always of our week, of our, our visit to Vancouver when we go see the kids. And I love it that every morning service begins on our knees. We were part of a Baptist church some time ago, it's about 15 years ago, and they were maybe 20, they were remodeling the church getting new furniture and everything else. And I suggested, hmm, maybe we should get kneeling benches. You know what the answer was? We're Baptist. <laughs> exactly. That's a problem. One more text. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 to 7. An interesting text. Biblical wisdom literature has very little to say about official religion, cultic worship. But here, stuck in the middle of this, the notion of worship as an audience with God. Guard your Ecclesiastes 5, 1 to 7. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Approach God to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know they do wrong. Do not be quick to speak. Do not impulsively blabber anything before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. So keep your words to a minimum. That's 
the paradigm. Well, what about the New Testament? And of course, some of us won't believe any of this. People keep telling me, come on, Block, get out of the Old Testament. We're Christians. Well, part of the problem here is the New Testament doesn't actually tell us much about what we're supposed to do in church. And the closest, well, yes, you do have a little bit in, in Acts chapter 2. They met for breaking of bread and prayer and apostles' teaching, whatever. If uh, David Peterson, in his writings on worship, he, he mentions that the best images of true worship come from the book of Revelation where you got visions of the heavenly and glorious reality. And his comment is, look, is this, if this is the image of eternal worship, let's start practicing now. And so it has implications, especially for our theology of worship. You've got a couple of these scenes, Revelation 5, 9 to 14. They sang a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered. Actually, this scene begins with uh, the... the the Lord on his throne, and next to him, the person arrives, the lion, the root of David, the lamb. And at the sight of him, people fall down, and they break out in a three-part song of worship. Nobody, I mean, God, either the one seated on the throne or Jesus, the lamb, neither of them's talking here. But everybody's worshiping. And you have to ask, where's the audience? What kind of audience is this? It's all been said. And they know it's all been said because they break out in response to what they have learned in their magnificent song. Well, enough of that paradigm of worship. In my view, when we gather as a community of believers to worship, the primary item on the agenda is the Lord speaking. That's why we come. That's why he invites us. It's not about us speaking. Oh, yes, sing to one another, Paul says. Sing to one another songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. But in the context of what? And in my view, it's in the context of the Lord revealing himself to those whom he invites into his presence. But this raises the question, one more uh, topic that I need to deal with very, very briefly. How did the Israelites hear the voice of God in the Old Testament? When they were at worship, did the, God's voice come thundering through the ceiling? We have no record of that. Well, then how did God speak to ancient Israel when they gathered for worship? Well, we can start with the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> this is one long Russian worship service. <laughs> Those of you who've been there, at least they don't do it so much anymore, unfortunately. But I have, I have preached in a service where I was the third preacher of the morning. They regularly had two or three services. Well, the book of Deuteronomy is Moses' last worship service with his people. And in this worship service, he has four sermons, one to four, five to 11, 12 to 26, 29 to 30, four speeches of Moses. Then there's a closing hymn, chapter 32. And then there's the benediction. He blesses all the tribes, chapter 33. And then he's off the stage. The service is over. Next time somebody else has to take over. This is Moses' farewell worship service with his people. Moses has only one title in the book of Deuteronomy, and that's prophet. This book is prophetic preaching, pastoral, prophetic pastoral ministry at its finest. How does God speak? In the context of this book, we have a clue how God would speak in the ancient. 
Have you ever scoured the scriptures to see what they say about how to use scripture in worship? How did they use the Decalogue, Ten Commandments in worship? Did they? There are no texts that they're supposed to do that. There are no texts telling us that you must read the Psalms in worship. There are no texts that tell us you must read the prophets in worship. Well, what were they supposed to read? Here's a very interesting text. At the end of the book, he's finished preaching. Then Moses transcribed this Torah, that is, that which he has been preaching. He committed it to writing. He handed it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses charged them. At the end of every seven years, at the assigned time in the year of release, at the festival of booths, Sakot, and when all Israel comes to see the face of the Lord your God at the place that he will choose. This is, notice the audience, the invitation to his presence. You shall read this Torah before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, little ones, and the sojourner within your towns that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and keep all the words of this Torah by doing them and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. Here are clear instructions on how to use what Moses has just preached and committed to writing in worship. Every seven years, the Levitical priests are to read this whole thing to all the people gathered. That's worship. The community has come together. And in the hearing of the words of Moses... The text says over and over again, Moses spoke as God commanded him. The whole book is Moses is consciously inspired by God to say what he's doing and then to write what he's doing. And this is what they read. And in this, they hear the voice of God. See how this works. There's a formula that is found repeatedly in Scripture. Read that they may hear, that they may learn, that they may fear, that they may obey, really listen, that they may live. The, all of the elements of this are in two texts. In chapter 17, the king is supposed, to, is told to, well, you don't use your office for self-aggrandizement. Don't multiply horses, don't multiply wives, don't multiply uh, silver and gold, but this you shall do for yourself. The king shall, in the presence of the Levitical priest, write for himself a copy of this Torah, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it, that he may learn to fear the Lord, and that he may walk in his ways, never turning to the right or to the left, that he'll sit long on the throne. That's the paradigm. And of course, now in our Deuteronomy 31, 11 to 13 text, we have it applied to all the people. Interestingly, that king's text, Deuteronomy 17, that, that's the only place in all of Scripture where somebody is told to read Scripture for yourself. We could go on and on about that one. To us, it's become all about, have you read your Bible lately? Are you reading scripture for yourself? The Bible wasn't written to be read by yourself. It was written to be heard in community. The Levites are to read it to the people. They wouldn't have had, well, most of the people would have been illiterate anyhow, couldn't read. And even if they could read, how could you get a copy of this Torah, your own copy? You couldn't because it's all handwritten. Whatever else, it'd take forever. At best, you probably had the primary copy at the sanctuary beside the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> and you may have had a copy for each of the Levites out in the Levitical towns where they're supposed to teach Torah. But people wouldn't, nobody would have had his own private copy. The scriptures weren't read to be read, written to be read privately. They were written to be heard together in community. 
And in fact, it becomes a covenantal moment. When you hear, Deuteronomy is all about the covenant relationship. When we hear it together, we renew the covenant with God and we commit ourselves anew because of all that the Lord has done for us. We commit ourselves anew to living the life of covenant faithfulness. And of course, in this all, you have this magnificent formula. Read that they may hear, that they may learn that they may fear, that they may obey, that they may live. This is ch chain reaction. You begin by reading, then hearing, then learning, then fearing, then obeying, listening, and then finally live. The Torah, hearing the Torah, is the key to life. We could turn it around and do what Paul does in Romans chapter 10, where he talks about how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach unless they be sent? And <laughs> you, you know those rhetorical questions. Let's do How shall they live if they do not obey? How shall they obey if they do not fear? How shall they fear if they do not learn? How shall they learn if they do not hear? How shall they hear if no one reads and we hear it together a text like psalm 1 blessed is a man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly nor stand in the way of sinners nor sit in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the torah of the lord where do you get it how does he know the torah of the lord he meditates on it day and night not, he's, re he's not reading it. He has learned it. He's memorized. He's heard it in community. And all day long, this is what's going on in his mind. He's ruminating on it. And of course, these questions are like uh, you have uh, Paul's questions in Romans. Well, what about New Testament? I wish we had more time, but there it's an interesting thing that happens when you read the New Testament. When I read Paul's epistles, I can't believe. I mean, he's writing to the Galatians. And the book of Galatians is filled with all these Old Testament allusions. Who are the Galatians? Well, there are two parties in the book of Galatians. The, the Judaizers... <laughs> And then there are the Galatians. Who are they? They're pagans who have come to faith in Jesus. They've never had contact with Hebrew tradition. And yet Galatians is full of First Testament texts and allusions and Abram, all the rest. How, how does that make sense to them? I have a feeling. That in the process of evangelism and planting churches, high on the agenda was reading the Torah, reading scripture. And everybody knows what this is about. It's a part of the rhetoric. Now, of course, not, it doesn't take very long for Paul's letters to begin taking the status. Paul is a second Moses, like Moses. Paul was commissioned by God. Like Moses, Paul was inspired to preach. He was inspired to write, and he left written documents. But when he writes to the Colossians, he tells them in Colossians, I think we have a couple of uh, texts. I'm, I'm skipping over some of these. When this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the latest sins and see that you also read the letter. Oh, Really? So now we have added to the First Testament scriptures, we've got Paul's letters become scripture. And very quickly we recognize God speaks. Paul writes, by the will of God.
Uh, there's a little bit in the book, uh, but uh, in a couple of other places uh, I have uh, written about this. But here is the gist of it. Implications for the use of scripture in worship today. Point number one, evangelicals. Now, there are some ironies here. Why is it these days that if you want to hear lots of scripture read in church, you have to go to a liberal church? (laughs) That's true. It really is true. They have far more scripture than we do. Well, what are we going to do about this? First, evangelicals must rediscover that in hearing the scriptures, worshipers hear the voice of God. We come to hear God speak, not the preacher or the musicians. It's for God to speak. Protestants have historically elevated the role of preaching in Christian worship. However, we must remember that the scriptures were not written primarily to be preached. They were written to be heard. The scriptures are the sermon. Indeed, the scriptures represent the original sermons of God's inspired prophets and apostles and Moses' sermons in Deuteronomy, the narratives of judges, the prophecies of Ezekiel, the gospel of Mark, the epistle of James come to us as truly inspired preaching. Exposition may be needed to make the text understandable for modern hearers, but... When I am preaching, my interpretations are always fallible. Subject to correction. I get lots of things wrong. The scripture never gets anything wrong. It is the sermon we need to hear. Second, evangelicals need to rediscover the transforming power of scripture. The transforming power is assumed in Moses' charge to the Levites to read that they may hear, that they may learn, that they may fear, that they may walk in his ways, that they may live. That's the point. Transforming power of Scripture. Third, evangelicals must rediscover the joy of a Catholic reading and hearing. By this I mean all together. Hearing Scripture in worship is a communal and covenantal enterprise intended for, uh, intended for full participation with our contemporaries and in communion with the saints who have preceded us and those in the far corners of the world. Fourth, evangelical worship leaders need to rediscover the lost art of expository reading of Scripture. Try it sometime. I've been involved in a couple of experiences like this. We were in Cambridge, and uh, in, the, in the sermon that we heard at St. Andrew the Great, the great Anglican, evangelical Anglican church right in the heart of Cambridge, in that Sunday morning, January 24th, 2010, from the front we heard First Chronicles 13.1, to 1643. The whole thing. In, in our church, the college church in Wheat, and I've been plaguing my, our people for, we're in our eighth year now in the book of Deuteronomy. When we started out, I mean, after the introduction, I read Moses' whole first sermon. Chapters 1 through 4. And then we had about 15, 10, 15 minutes left. And I asked the people, what did God say to you? I was amazed what they heard. We don't let this. We tried this also at college. I mean... The, the first year I taught the course there on biblical theology of worship. There's a 
A guy in the class, a musician, a wonderful guy who's now actually a minister of, of music in one of the churches here in, in the South. But he went to the chaplain and asked if he could plan, after the, after the course, he could plan a chapel service for the Monday after, uh, no, the Monday before the, of Holy Week. Well, the, ch- the chaplain asked, well, what are you going to do? Well, he said, we'll have one or two pieces of music, and then we're going to have scripture. And we read scripture, John 12, 20 to 36a, and then 13, 1 to 38, and 18, and chapters 18 and 19, the whole thing. By the time we were at the end, you could 2,000 college students, you could have heard a pin drop. I'd never, it was such a holy moment preparing us for Passion Week. Try it sometime. Now, when I, you know, I'm, I'm still teaching. Next, uh, next uh, in two weeks when I come back from Israel, will be on Deuteronomy 33. Read that lately? What I will do is I will tell the people, put your Bibles down. Don't follow along. You know, there's a problem when you invite people to open your Bibles and we're going to read. A couple of problems. One, these days, well, why does he use that translation? We all have different translations, so it's very confusing. Or second, if he's got the same translation, he skipped a word. Hey, that's the devil's trick to keep you from hearing. So I tell, put your Bibles down, close them, don't look at them. Open your ears and listen together. So next, when we come back after the uh, Tel Aviv visit, uh, when we come back, I will read the whole text and I will ask them, what did the Lord say to you? I won't have to prepare anything that Sunday morning. Some people say, well, it's just because you're too lazy to get anything. No, it's not. It arises out of a fundamental theological conviction that it is the scripture that is the inspired word of God, not the preacher. Well, there's a level of inspiration in preaching, and we need to pray always that the Lord protect us from, from speaking untruth. And so before a sermon, I will often pray, Lord, anything that is true in keeping with your word, burn it indelibly in our hearts, but that which I say is wrong, help us to forget it immediately. Because I'm so prone to blabber falsehood. People come for a word from God. There are ways of expository reading, but we don't do it badly. I I have some suggestions for you. We need to recover uh, uh, how to do this. And finally, number five, we need to rediscover the gravitas and awesome responsibility of the public reading of Scripture. I don't, I'm not saying the ordained pastor has to be the one. I don't, think, I don't think it should be that way. But I think the public reading of Scripture should be the highlight of the worship service. But it's a lost art. It's a lost art. If we would learn to read, I mean, when our kids were small, our, when our kids were small, I would read a story from them, you know, the arts books, you know, lots of Bible stories. And at the end, I would sing the song, sing the story to them after I'd done reading it. <laughs> there are lots of ways of doing it. But on the other hand, people come for a word from God. They don't come for an audience with you. We need to get out of the way. I mean, it's easy for us preacher types to say that of musicians. They're idolaters. They're just all about themselves, egotistic, whatever. You hear that all the time. But I, I've got news for you. We got the same problem. And at the end of the service, we want people to say, that was a great sermon. I don't want people to say that. 
I want them to have heard the voice of God. They've come to an audience with him, not with me. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, that you have spoken in mercy and in human language. And of course, ultimately, in Jesus Christ, the incarnate word. Open our ears to hear your voice. Give us a hunger and thirst after you. Nothing else for the blessed honor and glory of our Savior. We ask it. Amen. Amen. Are we supposed to have questions now? We, we can do that. All right. The interesting thing in evangelical words, and that and the, the, the free church tradition is, you know, people in the reformed tradition, they've got lots of books out on worse of all, they do much better. When I was writing that book, as I say in the introduction, it's primary people in the free church have no theology of worship and they have no tradition that drives theological tradition. You know, so uh, we need to become Bereans even when you hear something like this. Don't say Block said. It has nothing to do with what I said. Check the scriptures to see whether it be so. And if it is so, own it, claim it, and live it. If it's not, hey, it's a fad, whatever else. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I love the, the, the focus on scripture and how to use scripture in worship. And you showed us a couple examples of bad music. But how should we use music in worship? How can it accentuate? How do you think the Old Testament or Scripture would say, this is the way to use music to make our worship experience better? Well, that's a great question. I come from a very musical family. You couldn't tell it when I did a little ditty there. But... <laughs> and my wife comes from an even more musical family. So I am not. I, I feel so sorry for congregations whose pastors have no musical sensibilities. I really do. I feel as sorry for that as, as when our musicians have no theological senses. Those are two problems. And, and, and unfortunately, we're saying that's your part of the world. You do that. And no, I think, well, I think we need to be sober and recognize the place of music in biblical worship. In our world, music has become worship. I mean, go to the bookstores or, you know, Amazon. Praise and worship. It's never lament and worship. It's a certain kind of music. How should music be used? I think we ought to uh, discipline ourselves to using music that has theological integrity, lyrical integrity. I mean, what I had on the screen, that isn't even poetry. It's an insult to anybody in your congregation with any literary flair. And in my view, it's an even bigger insult to the person we say we're worshiping. So it has to have lyrical and musical integrity. I think also regularly in our worship, we should have something for everybody. You're going to think, I'm just an old fogey of my, you know, the, that which I grew up. No, 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 no. I wish we would sing far more often little ditties for our kids. Jesus loves me, this I know. I mean, that's the song we're singing. Why don't we do that in worship? Regularly, something for everybody, but at the same time, if 
When I've been a Christian for 20 years, I am still singing the same kind of stuff that I was singing when I was a baby. We got a problem. So that we should be increasing our appetites for beyond milk. But these days, the emphasis is on getting people to appreciate pablum. Which is why we've alienated whole generations of people. And I say, we need to start blessing everybody. And we need to stop asking, uh, why don't you sing my kind of music? What we should be doing is going to the people and say, is there some kind of music you like that we might bless you with? Changes everything. Changes the whole tone of the debate. So that we're not looking out for ourselves anymore. We're looking out for the... What blesses you? And what blesses a 40-year-old, hopefully, is slightly different from what blesses a 20-year-old. And what blesses a 60. If it isn't different, then what have we done in terms of educating and what growth? So, I I, I think... uh, being very deliberate in how we work. The, the other thing that's really sobering when I read the scripture, what kind of music did they do in tabernacle worship? Pardon me? We have no idea. We have no idea. There isn't a single hint of what kind of music they did those 40 years in the desert. And as long as the tabernacle was at Shiloh, for centuries at Shiloh, before they built the temple. And then all of a sudden, David comes on the scene, the sweet psalmist of Israel, and he writes all kinds of music, and it takes off. Well, hadn't they been worshiping properly beforehand? I'm sure, for the most part, they hadn't. That's the problem. (laughs) But I'm sure, on the other hand, they had. But in the Pentateuch, where you have these texts, there are songs sprinkled all over the place, but they're never part of regular worship. They're celebrations of stuff. You know? so, so I think that's sobering, where we have made music worship or the center of gravity. I was flying to Kansas City the, the year of 9-11, and uh, a couple of stories out of that one. 9-11, the week after. That happened on a Tuesday, didn't it? And I, I flew out on, on the Saturday. And the Sunday morning, there were three services. There was a small chapel service for about 100 people first at 8 o'clock downstairs. And then we'd come up to the big uh, sanctuary for two more services there. And I'd always come from the bottom. I'd come up late. And the Sunday after 9-11, I heard the worship, the music minister say, let's praise the Lord anyway. And we tried to sing this raucous, loud, you know, enthusiastic song. And I thought, whoa, that is sacrilege. On that Sunday, across this country, church attendance was 40% higher than normal. I tell you, they didn't come to sing. They came to weep. We don't let people have a chance to weep. Guaranteed, every Sunday morning when you gather, 30% of your people have had an awful week. They've come to cry. We need to let them cry so that in our music include songs of grief and pain. The psalmists, did you know that there are twice as many psalms of lament as psalms of praise in the Psalter? Oh, some of them, they begin with lament and they end with praise, but they start with a lament. We don't have time for that. No. We want people to come back next week, have a good time, and feel good about what happened. No, some of us need to feel awful about what happened. We need to be convicted of our sin and broken 
in our spirits and not camouflaged into, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all a mess. You know, so let we, we preachers have to think of the same thing. We can't just let them go of every Sunday feeling good. We want you back next Sunday. Well, if your goal is to fill the church, that's what you'll do. But our goal is not to fill the church. Our goal is to bring people to maturity in Christ. And that's a different agenda. Long answer to a short question. Um, so when you were talking about the um, grasping the paradigm for worship and and um, criticizing a little bit the um, audience of one framework, I wanted to ask you just to elaborate a little bit because as we were talking about it from a kingship framework, I kept thinking about that in tandem with the kinship framework. So when we're talking about kingship, thinking about Genesis one and two, and that kinship relationship between God and Adam. And then also when you talked about, I think it was Revelation 5, maybe, um, Revelation 22, and that goal of restoration in the garden. And as a parent myself, thinking about some of the imperfect ways my own children have approached me yes. um, and said, hey, come, come be with me. I, I want you with me. And yeah. sort of the... Uh, naive hubris, but as a parent, loving and wanting to reach out to them in their imperfect request of me, and sort of all that together, just wondering, how do you hold in tension the kinship uh, framework and the kingship framework as a, as a human when you worship? Well, I think this is why that text in Deuteronomy is so important. Who is talking? There you may come into my presence. God is Israel, uh, the, the, the children of God. That's what happened at Mount Sinai. They were ad formally adopted as his sons. So this is now a family deal. But of course, we have to remember, and there are some people here who know far more about this than I do, but we have to remember that in, in biblical paradigm, according to biblical paradigms, the relationship between a father and a son or a mother and a daughter is not primarily uh, we're friends, playmates. The parent has an awesome charge. Not just to get down onto the level with the kids. I love wrestling with my grandkids and whatever else. I love to do that. But on the other hand, the agenda is to bring them to where we are. Ultimately, you know, so there's, there's even that tension. But the role of a parent in the scriptures is primarily that of one to whom the child attributes origin and secondly, in whom the child finds absolute security. It's not a playmate. In Ben Sirach, there's an interesting text. If you love your child, beat him often. Do not play with your child. I'm glad that's not in my Bible. <laughs> You know, over Christmas, I played with my grandkids. I never got to do that with my grandfather. One of them stayed in Russia, and the other one was uh, deceased before I was even born. But here, I was playing with my grandkids, pond hockey up there in Chicago. They're from, they're from South Carolina. They came up for a, a winter Christmas, and we had it. It was such fun. You know, so there's a, there's a place for all of that. But in the end, we have to recognize that we are to be people that they one day want to be like. Paradigms of virtue and righteousness. Not paradigms of fun. That's the entertainment world in which we live. And we think that's our role. So, but it is a tough one. There, everything has tension. How to, how to be 
properly formal with God and how to be properly informal. Because God invites us. Enoch walked with God. That expression, I think you have only three times in Scripture. Or four, actually. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. Uh, in Revelation, they will walk with him in white. And then My- Micah, uh, he has told you, man, what is good but to love justice and to do chesed and walk humbly with. I'm glad he put humbly in there. But some of us, we walk with God and say, tell the world, aren't, isn't God lucky to have us? No. What an awesome grace. Can't believe he invited me to walk with him. That's, you know, that's the other side of it. Um, it's a confident relationship. You know, so there's intimacy at some level, but it's never casual. Relationship with God shouldn't be casual. It can be warm, it can be close. I'm curious with your table, too, about how you would feel about applying a New Testament paradigm of hearing, learning as believing, fearing as repenting, obedience as confession, baptism, living well as walking in the light, as he is in the light? Hmm. Uh, I would probably adjust those some. Uh, Keep learning as learning, but fearing. Have you ever done a, a study of the word for fear? I... I hadn't actually until until recently something troubled me and it triggered something. When Abraham offers up his son Isaac, now the Lord tested Abraham say, saying, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a whole burnt offering the place that I'm going to show. Well, he walks for three days and they get to... <laughs> to the bottom of the mountain. He says to his servants, stay here, we'll come back. But we're going up to worship. That's the first occurrence of that word in the Bible. Worship, prostrate in submission and homage. This is no good feeling moment. (laughs) And then they get up there and he builds the altar and he lays out the wood. You noticed how the narrative just slows down so that we agonize with Abraham over this whole thing. I mean, it's just excruciating. This can't be right because it's a test. I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. What are we going to do here? But he does it, the Lord says. And what is the He's about to stab him and the angel grabs his hand. If you've been to St. Petersburg and seen Rembrandt's painting of this. I, when I saw that, I sat there for 20 minutes just imagine. But what does the angel say? Now I know that you fear me. Are afraid of me? Had nothing to do with fright. Tomorrow I will have a spectrum on the screen of this word for fear. It means everything from terror, the Israelites at Sinai. Stop, stop, we're all dead. Moses, you go talk to him, but we're we're finished. Oy vey. To anxiety, to respect, to reverent awe, to allegiance, to trusting. 
The whole spectrum is in the book of Deuteronomy. That whole range of meanings. So that when God says to Abram, now I know that you fear me. What has he actually tested? The Lord tested Abraham after these things. After what things? He had just said in chapter 21, not in Ishmael, but in Isaac. After that, then God says, okay, let's get rid of Isaac. That's the test. The test is, can you believe God? Can you trust him to solve his own problems? But the angel says, now I know that you fear me. Oh, it really means, now I know that you trust me implicitly. And that word is used out so that in this thing, if, if uh, I think what's actually going on here, learn that they may fear. Let's not be afraid. There are places in scripture, some of these other references uh, up, uh, ab- above, If you read those texts, some of them have to do with that people will hear of the verdict in a criminal case and they will fear and not do the same thing. There it's fright. Motivation to stay on track. But in these cases, I don't think it's fright at all. I think it's trust. Because when the Torah is read... You learn all that God has done for Israel over and over and over again. The book of Deuteronomy is all about gospel. I mean, just go to the Ten Commandments. That's what you call it. I don't. The Bible doesn't, so I don't either. It's the Decalogue. Ten words. How do they start? They don't start with, you shall have no other gods besides me. That's moralism. Legalism. How do they start? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Follow all of those grace themes through Deuteronomy. I tell you, you'll come away trusting. It's exactly what should happen to us every time we eat of the Lord's, at the Lord's table. We've been reminded of the gospel, so we fear. Not in the sense of fright, but the, really the best solution is trusting awe or awed trust. And I think that's what that fear is. Trusting in him and in view of all that he's done, we obey. We listen to his voice and we do Not out of duty, that's deontological ethic, because he said so. No, we do it out of gratitude for all that he has done. And when that's what happens, you live. I think that's the way. And in the New Testament, you do have some of the same paradigms. I mean, to me, John 15 is very sobering. I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And what's the fruit? Throughout the text, if you love me, keep my commands. But any branch that doesn't, he cuts it off. So there you've got the consequences of not listening. is death. The paradigm's exactly the same. Nothing changes. And so um, Paul, in his letter to the Galatians on the contrast between... uh, Evil and the fruits of the spirit Uh, yield either condemnation or they yield that. That, I I find no difference in the in the paradigms. But that but that is a great question to ask. We're just not expected to find parallels, because in our theology, the new fixes the old, as if the old is a problem. No, God never does a thing that's a problem, that needs fixing. Retraction, oops, I made a mistake. That didn't work, so I'll try something else. No, the problem is not what God has done. The problem is Israel's response. And of course, what happens in the new is the climax of a single story. It's not an alternative story. So we need to be looking for 
points of coherence, cohesion, a single thread working all the way through. Um, but we, we've come to expect the but. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth happened, as if that's the contrast. Law versus grace. No. It's mediated grace versus embodied grace. <laughs> it's all grace. Grace upon grace. You're probably done and you're exhausted. Give Dr. Block a round of applause. <laughs> We thank all of you who are here with us tonight. We have 30 online that are joining us as well. Probably a lot due to the weather, but it's good to have everyone here with us. We hope you'll come back tomorrow night. Just a couple of house cleaning things. You'll see there in front of you a card. Um, the Cooley Center is uh, supported by the um, grace and the efforts of our patrons. And so if you would be interested in joining our patron society, uh, that's some information that uh, is there for you. Also, the notes that you have, if you wrote on, please feel free to take them. But if you're coming back tomorrow night, bring them back with you. Um, if you're not coming back tonight and you didn't write on them, then please leave them and we'll use them uh, tomorrow night as well. Um, check out our website. Uh, go to the Charlotte homepage. Look under Resources Center for Early Christianity. And there's a lot of resources there. We have all of our previous lectures online for you to listen to and watch. Uh, we have resources, bibliographies, web links, uh, articles, um, even a blog. So uh, if you have a chance, check out our website and keep track of what we're doing. And there we'll announce uh, future events as well. Uh, Dr. Peter Williams will be here uh, next January or February for our, our lecture. So just to give you some heads up there from uh, Tyndall House. So uh, that we're excited about that. And uh, soon we'll be announcing uh, some information regarding our fall lectures. But again, we appreciate you coming out, and uh, let's have a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to gather and think about worship. We certainly have been given a lot to think about tonight. Um, and I pray as we've been admonished that we would hear your voice as we seek uh, to deal with this uh, topic. Uh, we're thankful for Dr. Block and his willingness to come and share with us. And may we grow, may we learn, and may we become the people and the congregations uh, that hear from you and truly experience worship. As we leave here tonight, keep us safe as we travel. Uh, some will be traveling on dangerous roads. Pray that you would protect them. And again, bring us back tomorrow night and challenge us again through your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.